Hello everyone, welcome to our panel. So we're going to be focusing on <coughs> the local production trends and uh, part with a focus on partnerships and co-productions. I have with me an esteemed panel, so I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves, give us a bit uh, of some info around uh, the company you work for and obviously any mission statements that you feel would be fit. So let me start with uh, Suri. Suri, can you hear me? Okay, I think we've lost Suri, so I'm going to start with Ayana. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Ayana Lonian. I'm a member of the content acquisition team that supports uh, Amazon's Prime Video service. Uh, so I'm, I'm based in LA. Uh, I manage a couple of different teams within Amazon, but one of which is the content acquisition team that supports our services within Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, super. Over to you, Olu. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Olu Obadino. I'm chairman at Invivo, and um, I am also chairman of um, the sister company that's into production, um, Navida Studios. Okay, I see Suri is back. So Suri, a brief introduction of yourself and uh, digital media, please Are you muted? Please unmute. Hi, I'm Suri Ramasuri. Um, I've been in the telco industry for close to 20 years, working with the mobile um, operators, launching products and digital OTT across um, Africa, MENA, and Europe. I recently launched my own platform um, called Avatar, which is a content streaming platform that has a combination of um, BOD, kids, e-learning, and free entertainment, and gaming. Okay, so super. We're going to kick off with a general overview of the content production landscape in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to start with you, Olu. In your opinion, what do you believe have been the major transformation in the video landscape over the last couple of years? Uh, Olu, you're muted. Oh, yes, um, thank you. Okay, so basically what has happened um, in the last couple of years um, is that um, we are seeing the influx of um, global platforms um, coming into the region and this influx has informed the need, you know, to start paying attention to the quality of content um, that's been produced, you know, and um, basically and gradually we have started seeing um, um, in terms of quality content going to um, the next level in terms of, um, you know, um, the story, you know, the scriptings, uh, post-production, you know, and we are getting to that point where we're bridging the gap between Hollywood and um, African films. Okay. Uh, Suri, what do you believe have been the major transformation over the last couple of years? So I think there's been um, a couple of aspects. Um, the one is the rapid increase in, in video distribution and consumption. I and mean, we can see social platforms like Facebook and YouTube and how it's exploding in terms of content, uh, videos being shared by consumers and billions of videos being shared um, in seconds. So consumers are starting to produce their own content now. There's lots of platforms that's allowing the user-generated content like TikTok, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, etc. cetera. Um, then the, the expansion of um, a large number of entrants of uh, OTT platforms. And I think COVID has allowed the acceleration of um, um, consumption, um, as well as uh, production by um, houses like Netflix and Amazon who are starting to produce more content to meet the demands um, um, in these platforms, but also the growth within Africa. And I think local content, uh, localized content is, is a huge demand. And a lot of these platforms are, are playing focus on production of this content. And also I think video in terms of how consumers are watching video and what they're watching 
and the relevance of video um, across these territories and production starts to play um, a huge role in meeting the demands um, when it comes to long form and short form content and also the growth of uh, and the demand for uh, series. Okay. Ayana, from your perspective, what are the specificities of the African content landscape compared to other regions of the world? Oh, uh, uh, let me think. I mean, I think there are a number of uh, unique things and wonderful things about content that you know originates and is produced in, in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the, con of the continent. I mean, I, I think you see certainly parallels in other parts of the world when I think about, for example, maybe the, the Bollywood industry, other formats that I think that resonate well within Sub-Saharan Africa, that resonate in other parts of the world, be that uh, telenovelas, uh, be that, you know, uh, Korean K-dramas, Japanese anime, what have you. So they're definitely, in terms of this, the, the vibrancy of the content creation and content production community in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are definitely, you know, different parallels that exist with, you know, again, you know, Bollywood, Hollywood, what have you, but it's a definitely, uh, very entrepreneurial, very energetic, the, the volume of content, the quality and the caliber of content. And then of course, just the, the unique stories that can only originate and do only originate in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa that are intrinsically unique to that part of the world. Okay, thank you. Lou, maybe just to understand from you, um, are you currently, have you been able to monetize successfully and also what type of business models have worked and for which type of content? Are you muted, Anu? So basically, um, like you know, um, we started off actually launching our own um, distribution platform and Vivo TV. Um, it was a free TV online streaming platform. And um, after a year of doing that, we actually changed strategy. Um, and what we do now is we make the platforms available for corporates that already have a subscriber base. So like banks, um, like telcos, and we whitelist them. Um, we make our um, production library, um, content library available to them. And we also create unique, unique content um, um, for them. So um, because of that, we've then now focus exclusively um, in terms of um, making our own productions. And we've done quite a couple of uh, production in the last couple of months. And we are still working on um, some as well. You know, so the business has changed from just yielding platforms for content to actually um, yielding the platforms for um, organization or corporates you know, that have a user group or a subscriber base, you know, already than, you know, putting on a TV and start chasing subscribers, you know, so, and then we concentrate now on making productions for those corporates and also for other platforms as well. Tamima, you are on mute. Suri, maybe you can give us some insight into the type of monetization strategies that are working for you. So I've uh, adopted a few models. Um, the, the platform that I've launched um, is across um, Africa and uh, very much focused on um, targeting the, the mass market. But um, as we've also heard from previous sessions, market is also a key target audience. And when deciding on how to monetize a platform um, together with the content that you make available, um, we need to understand how these, con these consumers will be able to subscribe to the content. So some of the models that I've used is partnerships with the mobile operators across Africa, where we do a direct integration with them for billing, and the customer can use their prepaid airtime to subscribe. Other platforms that are, um, are doing very well is the mobile money platforms where a lot of customers are used to payment methods using these billing options. So we've integrated to, uh, to that as another option. Um, credit card is also an option, but the market that we're targeting, not uh, many consumers 
have access to credit cards and using that. Um, banking, um, as Olo mentioned, is another element where they're starting to build some key um, um, aspects in terms of delivering um, content to um, end users using their bank accounts. So we're busy talking to some of the banks um, to do that. Um, but together with um, these different billing um, methods and options to allow customers access, we also looked at um, our pricing models to be able to allow customers to subscribe for a day, a week, or a month. Um, so it gives them full access for a complete day at a low affordable price point. Um, we also looked at consumers, how do we bring consumers onto the platform and start to bridge the digital divide and give them access to content. Um, so we have a freemium um, element to the platform where customers can just register on the platform and watch content for free. And this is monetized through advertising revenue in a very unintrusive way. But I think going into the future, there's lots of other models in terms of monetizing contents, in terms of sponsored um, advertising, um, allowing interstitial ads um, and giving customers access to content for free and having those paid for um, by retailers or um, um, companies that want to advertise and, and own spaces within um, the content to, to grab audiences. Okay. So currently we know that there is a proliferation of international OTT services on the continent. Uh, so do you think this is a threat for the local actors? I don't think it's a, a threat. I think it's more an opportunity for them because if you look at how they sell their content today, and I'm finding difficulty at the moment to get uh, local content, is there's two ways that they, they sell their content today. It has to be a minimum guarantee um, or they will produce for um, uh, big houses like Netflix that want uh, exclusives and originals, but the Netflix will obviously own the content. Um, and they don't want to look at the revenue share option with the OTT platforms. Everything has to be on um, a minimum guarantee, which a lot of platforms cannot afford minimum guarantees. And also, I know they are a bit nervous because in the past, when they initially went onto SBOT platforms, it took long for the monetization of the platforms. But the market wasn't ready at the time. The markets evolved completely now where there is a good availability of smart devices, consumers are, are more educated, um, they know how to use the technology, um, they've been on platforms, uh, COVID has caused the acceleration of people going onto these platforms and learning how to use it. So the market dynamics are changed. And the monetization now, even with, as I mentioned, with the billing through mobile operators, allows you to bigger audience and easier to build now compared to previously. So um, it's a huge opportunity for them for annuity income. And with this annuity income, it allows them to start producing more content um, compared to now just paying for the content once off and they never get the monetization of that going forward. Olu, uh, your opinion on the proliferation of uh, international OTTs and the impact on the local actors in your region? Um, yeah. Okay, so I don't know about uh, proliferation, but I know about um, incursions of a few of the international platforms um, to, to Africa. Um, the implication of that, like I had said earlier, is um, you would see that the um, production houses are now putting in a bit more effort in terms of trying to um, increase or, you know, do more in terms of the quality of the output. And they are also achieving that by now even working with um, international production houses that are already um, producing content for the platforms um, in a co-production kind of arrangement. And that also has been able to have a bearing on increased quality for the content. You know, so for me, um, it's a good thing for the industry. Um, it's one um, thing that I know um, clearly can 
actually force the industry to go to the next level. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the current content offering that is available on the continent and maybe try to understand what the state of uh, local production is currently in sub-Saharan Africa, the typology of content available. So what are some of the challenges that we still have to overcome? Over to you, Suri. So I think some of the, the challenges um, is um, localizing that content and dubbing it um, into different languages, which is not um, easily available. And I think it's also the, the costs involved to start um, dubbing this content. But um, the moment you start doing that, it, I mean, it, it reduces your cost in terms of producing more because you produce less now and you dub in different languages. And as an example, I mean, in Africa, um, the content that consumers want is the content, the, the local African content, but dubbed in French, in Portuguese, in Spanish, um, and the different local um, languages. I mean, in South Africa, majority of our content is um, in English, you get a bit of Afrikaans, but our local languages, um, very difficult to find that content. And that, in its own right, if we have that type of content, um, it will, will grow exponentially in terms of um, consumption of that content and uh, subscriptions for uh, producers. Um, I think also, um, I know this question kind of uh, would, would most likely come up later, but um, short form content. I mean, a lot of producers are producing long form content, but customers need the time to sit and watch this content. But if they start taking the content that they're producing it and, and, and transforming it into bite-sized content, I call it movie soaps, um, because if you look at the audiences that are watching this content, majority are starting to watch it on their mobile devices. And when this content is designed, it needs to make sure that it is compressed and caters for the mobile devices. Um, data is a big issue in terms of uh, viewership. So um, having uh, some con countries are more advanced in terms of good quality uh, data, but not so much in, in a lot of the African countries. So producing this content and making sure that it is compressed so that it can be watched on uh, um, lower levels of, of data networks on the 3G network, et cetera, will help in terms of producing quality content for um, the end user. And I think the, the, the short form bite size, like between five and 10 minutes content. So you can take your full um, episode that generally is, or your movie that's about 60 minutes or, or a 30 minute series and break that down into five to 10 minute clips, which you can then get out to uh, distribute to a larger audience. Okay. Ayana, maybe from your perspective, uh, what are the gaps in terms of the typology of local content available in uh, sub-Saharan Africa? What are the gaps in terms of, I just want to make sure I hear the question, gaps in terms yes. of type of content? Yes. So what, what, what do you feel is missing when you look at what's available on the continent? Well, I think there's lots of opportunity. Uh, I don't know if I would think of it more so as a gap or you could look at it as an inverse, like, you know, uh, and, and, and there, I guess I would say opportunities in, on a couple of different different levels. So if we're talking or thinking just about it from a purely like a, a content standpoint or, or a genre standpoint, I think Suri alluded to it earlier in some of her remarks, I think there's a ton of this sort of untapped opportunity when we think of like scripted TV series uh, in general, sort of, you know, wherever they originate across the continent, um, uh, high quality premium uh, scripted series, just a lot of activity for unscripted content. Uh, there are other genres and, and subgenres that I think can continue to be explored um, in, in ways that they are, have been more so, more so explored maybe in, in the U.S. or outside of the continent of Africa. And there is there a litany of genres, whether that's, um, you know, crime procedurals, sci-fi, uh, action, um, excuse me, animation, et cetera. So I think there's more, I don't view them as gaps, just more opportunities. And, and I think um, you know, resourcing is you know, resourcing uh, for for content creators will help to close those sort of gaps um, and help allow them to sort of lean into you know authentic uh, hyper hyper local stories to create more content. So maybe one of the other gaps, not thinking about it from like a, again a, a content or a genre standpoint, is just making sure that 
filmmakers and content creators have access to financing, have, you know, they uh, have access to things that allow them to create more content. And then I think there are some other things that are, are resident in other, other, we'll say, um, uh, you know, media sectors uh, in other parts of the world where Sub-Saharan Africa in some, in some respects is still evolving. And these are things that are, are less glamorous to think about, um, whether those are things like um, insurance, um, chain of title, uh, making sure that folks have an understanding of like IP ownership and some of the, the basic fundamentals that, that have to exist in, in any, you know, media ecosystem for it to truly mature in the way that, you know, that, uh, Hollywood has or other parts of the world. But I, I don't view it more as gaps. I just view it as sort of untapped opportunity. Okay, super. So, Olu, uh, when, you're when you're talking about what to bring to the audience, and uh, so we touched on it earlier, so in your territory, uh, what seems to be the route you take? Short formats versus long formats? Are you muted? Uh, please unmute. Okay, no, that's fine. Okay, so basically what um, we've seen here is that um, now because the number one, there is that proliferation of um, mobile phones, um, everyone seems to be on the move and they want to relate with content on the move as well. Um, there is that, you know, need or there is that um, overwhelming craze for short format content. I mean, something you can quickly watch on the move, something funny, you know, something that you don't need. That it's not very intellectual, so you don't need your brain so much. Um, you just need to watch and laugh and move on. Um, and and the shorter, the more, um, the more um, widespread they are, easy to share, you know, and things like that. Now, it's still some sort of a formal event. Um, on the other hand, to watch um, long form content because okay, then you have to prepare, you have to have a time, you have to be ready to, you know, not do anything for the next hour or two, you know, those kind of things. So yes, we've seen a lot of um, uh, proliferation of short form com com content, and um, I am of the opinion that that with time. Um, the the timing of content would keep reducing. Okay. Olu, uh, as being mainly a distribution platform, what are your relationships with content creators and content owners in the region? Okay, so um, we actually started from, um, well, as a background, we um, are also the organizers of the African International Film Festival. And as a, um, as a festival, we've actually been for some time like a hub or rallying point for content providers across the continent. You know, so where we get um, content submission over a thousand every year, you know, and therefore it puts us into um, a relationship with most content provider across the continent. Um, so we've leveraged on that in um, for our platform. Um, we know what, where to turn to um, in terms of what kind of content we're looking for. And sitting where we are, we actually just call for entry every year and we are privy to interact with all sorts of content. However, we have also, like I said um, about a year ago, um, started making content of our own as well um, for our clients and you know, for other platforms. Okay. Suri, obviously you interact a lot with uh, local content producers uh, in, the, in, in your territory. So what would you say are some of the main challenges they're currently facing? And uh, these are probably showing up in terms of the limitations we are seeing in the type of content that is available currently. So I believe the first main um, aspect is um, financing. I think like um, Olu mentioned as well as Ayana, where um, a lot of the content producers, because um, they, the content produced is sold at a once off um, and once that funds is now depleted, it's difficult because um, they don't have um, disposable income to produce more content. So they find that as a major challenge. 
um, and also finding uh, platforms because you must know the traditional behavior is that when content's produced, it's given to the likes of your broadcasting channels or multi-choice for DSTV or the local TV channels like SABC or to Netflix or Amazon. Now, if these platforms don't like your pitch, um, it's difficult for them to now go and apply for finance because they have to get um, interest from, from some platform to be able to go apply for finance. I think the availability of funds to allow the production of content um, um, is, is available. Um, for example, in South Africa, we've got uh, DTI that um, uh, funds production of um, movies, the um, banks, um, IDC, and a lot of the banks also um, support the um, financing of the production of content. And I mean, if you look at um, recent announcements with uh, Netflix and Amazon, where they also are investing a lot of funds in the production of local content. So I think funding is now becoming, become, have become more um, available to them. However, um, being able to pitch the right um, um, idea or concept um, to the market is, is quite um, difficult. But I think also, um, the, I think there's huge opportunity for uh, building a whole lot of genre of content in the different aspects. And I think from a, you've got certain producers like the big producers that are entering the markets, but how do we start to support up and coming artists? There's so much of good um, local content and I think there must be more education around this, more platforms to enable these up and coming artists to be able to um, pitch these type of, of offerings. And I, I don't know whether the film festivals um, is one element where they, they have um, sessions that all these local content producers can go and, and, and pitch or have a learning platform for them. And I think that's where it lacks in terms of all these up and coming artists that could allow us to expand in terms of local production. Okay. Uh, Olu, maybe just to understand uh, in, uh, in your region, uh, when it comes to financing local production, what are some of the existing limitations and how do you perhaps foresee the being uh, addressed? Okay, so um, basically, and to just put say it as it is, our financial institutions um, don't understand films. Um, they don't understand content. They don't understand the life cycle um, of uh, of content. They still don't have experts internally um, that understands the industry and how it works. And therefore, you will not see so many financial products. You know that is tailored exactly to the life cycle um, of a typical content. Um, having said that, we've had to, um, we've seen a few initiatives of government um, trying to intervene in the sector. Um, not, I don't know if you are aware, but um, the entertainment industry is the second largest employer of labor in Nigeria. And uh, the government is really trying to do a few things to sustain that, you know, so that results in um, situations where the government or development finance institutions um, will offer some form of, you know, financing offering to, to filmmakers. Um, having said that also, we've not seen so many filmmakers that understand the business of films, you know, so you also then have the backlash of, yeah, government provides the funding, um, but it don't mostly do well. Um, because they also don't understand the business of films. Um, most so-called filmmakers are just creatives who just want to create um, the cost of production vis-a-vis -vis what they could um, sell or license the movie or the TV shows for. doesn't really matter to them. They don't think through it or the commercials before they um, go into it. So at the end of the day, you also then see situations where um, yes, government is intervening, but they are also being burnt as well. You know, but I must say that gradually um, we started seeing people in finance 
um, looking at, you know, what can be done in this space. Um, I'm sure last year we witnessed a Virgin Bank launch $500 million um, for films. And, um, you know, and having even said that, you would notice that not so many have been able to avail themselves of, of, of that fund, you know, because of what is required. There's still a mismatch between what the bank requires and what um, the filmmakers would like to yield, you know. So, but um, like I said, there is a whole lot of awareness right now. Um, a group out of Nigeria just launching the first um, equity film fund um, last month. And uh, they are looking at raising an initial funding of, I think, $100 million. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So now, if that succeeds, um, now I, I I see that they are bringing capacities around that fund. You know, people who can sit and understand what is required to make um, a successful, a commercially successful thing. You know, so there is work ongoing to bridge that gap, but there's still a gap. Okay, thank you for that. I think that's uh, been very insightful in terms of what's happening in, in Nigeria. And obviously, I think uh, speaking for some other parts of the continent, uh, despite those being challenges, uh, I think it's quite significant to say that uh, they are very positive and welcome moves when you look at the level of investment that is actually being put forward. And speaking about investing, Ayana, Amazon has been investing significantly in Nigeria with uh, deals with uh, production companies like Ink Note and Antil in the last couple of months. So do these partnerships only focus on the distribution aspect or do you also plan to play an active role in, the produ in production with your partners? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we have a number of different, uh, I guess, a different uh, complexion of relationships with, with uh, local content uh, creators or partners uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, again, some of which have been either sort of publicly announced and some of which have, have not been publicly disclosed. And they, they run sort of the, the spectrum of different, I guess we'll say, um, licensing and or content creation, uh, you know, uh, opportunities. So from one end of the spectrum is, so, you know, this license of finished product, um, you know, again, a traditional sort of, you know, SPOD license, whether that content is, is uh, exclusive and unique to, to our service or not. And then on the other, the full other end of the spectrum are, you know, are, are things that we may, you know, develop, wholly undeveloped and or, you know, commission or co-pros or all sorts of things and, and types of deal constructs that exist in between those two sort of in those two goalposts as I described. And so you'll see us uh, be, um, you know, to, uh, have relationships that, again, run that spectrum. And we're, we're super excited to work with content creators. And again, there's, there's a variety of things, whether we, you know, develop and or create and or commission, whether we are, you know, this making that content available, you know, whether we're making that available solely in Sub-Saharan Africa or making that local content available in other parts of the world for the benefit of our customers around the world, where you'll see a, a variety a variety of different, um, I guess we'll say engagement models and or licensing and or, you know, commissioning constructs that we take advantage of in Sub-Saharan Africa, just as we do in other parts of the world. You are new, mm -hmm. Tamima. Sri, so earlier on you mentioned broadcasters. I'm curious, uh, traditional, are you looking towards working with broadcasters in future or even currently? So, um, Tamima, yes. Uh, I mean, I have um, approached some broadcasters, um, if you're meaning broadcasters in terms of linear streaming. Yes. So um, I have um, uh, worked with some um, in the past um, that I've approached in terms of making that content available, but the strategy for the platform was to first get certain verticals out into the market, launch in a few countries, and then start to expand in terms of the variety of um, content that we provide and bringing in some of the, the, the live um, channels um, onto the platform um, like news and um, some of the um, different TV channels in terms of the, um, the, the, the need for some of the, the demand for content um, typically for Africa. So um, I'm going very niche in terms of focus. Um, 
because I'm obviously not competing with the likes of Netflix and, and Amazon. That uh, is not my focus. Uh, my focus is more um, targeting the mass market, but bringing niche vertical of content and verticals that resonate with those markets and um, is relevant for these individual markets. So I spent a lot of time researching um, in Africa in terms of what customers are looking for, what type of content, where are the gaps in the market. Um, and that's where I'm focusing in terms of um, expanding. Um, being a local platform uh, provider um, and new to the market is obviously not easy, but uh, I've been very fortunate um, that I've had some good relationships with um, some content providers and got some really good um, quality content. But uh, I am looking for um, more localized content and thematic niche verticals, so open to talking to broadcasters as well as um, uh, production houses that um, I can monetize their content on the platform. Okay. Ayana, uh, maybe if you could give us your perspective on the state of infrastructures currently and perhaps where you see opportunities for content creators on the continent. Ayana, can you hear me? Sorry, yeah, uh, so sorry. I didn't know I was sorry. I'm just asking for your perspective, obviously, as a platform, when you look at what is currently available on the continent. Mm -hmm. So what's your perspective uh, in terms of the current state of in infrastructures and where do the opportunities lie? Uh, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, I think there's opportunity uh, part of, you know, I, I know I alluded to it earlier. I think there's definitely opportunity again for We'll say for uh, types of content, genres of content that have, I would say have been sort of underexplored, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. So I think there's certainly um, opportunity, just you know, from a content standpoint, you know, from a genre standpoint, different you know formats or subgenres. Again, a, a blend of you know, broadly speaking, genres that have not been explored, but but to do so with a premium, you know, a pre, to produce stories that are like hyper local, very authentic, multi dimensional. And again, it, this intrinsically sort of native to sub-Saharan Africa. So I think there's a lot of just, you know, opportunity there from a, a content standpoint. I think there's a ton of opportunity with like emerging uh, content creators, young content creators. Again, sometimes they're, they're limited by access to, to resourcing and financing as we sort of discussed earlier in the panel. But there's, there's no, I would say, shortage of talent uh, from a content creation standpoint, you know, in and across Sub-Saharan Africa, sometimes it's just a matter of providing those those content creators with resourcing, access to distribution, financing, et cetera, so that they can they can either hone their craft, tell the best stories that they can tell, um, and, and make their content available. So I think there's this again a lot of untapped uh, untapped opportunity, um, no shortage of talent, no shortage of just wonderful, authentic. Um, authentic um, stories to be told. Uh, there might also be an opportunity, I would say, for training. Um, you know, I, I, we were talking earlier about, you know, pitching ideas to, you know, whether it's a global streaming platform or a broadcaster or, or, or any, quite honestly, distribution uh, partner or potential investor. And I think there's like an art to how you pitch, uh, you know, when you're, you have an idea, there's a there's an there's a art and a science to that. Um, you'd be surprised sometimes how folks, you know, even when they, they, they get an opportunity to pitch at least someone uh, on my team or even myself, um, some folks take advantage of that. And other folks, quite honestly, it's, it's almost like they squander that window of opportunity that they have because they're just not used to pitching their ideas uh, to, you know, to, a, to a, 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 either a global distribution partner or a financing you know, a partner in a way that again, makes it compelling where you feel like, okay, got it. It's not that there's just a wonderful story there, but the, the, this potential partner can actually execute against this if, you know, if they're given financing and, and there's an art and science there. So I think there's definitely opportunity there just with training. Um, and some of that comes through a little bit of, of experience, but I think there's, there's lots of you know opportunity there, and there, there's you know in, in a variety of different buckets and in a variety of different ways. Okay. Also, uh, obviously, Nigeria is a leader when it comes to exporting local content abroad. Yeah? And Ayana was telling us about the arts, so I'm sure there are those who are participating in this panel who would want to know what is the art of successfully executing partnership strategies in the streaming landscape. Okay, um, so 
Basically, um, you know the role Nigeria play in terms of content production in Africa. Um, Nollywood is the biggest um, production or TV producing industry um, out of Africa. They say it's the second largest in the world in terms of number of contents and, and things like that. Um, like I had said earlier, um, partnerships and co-productions um, both provides opportunity, you know, for the content producers to be able to take, um, you know, their game slightly higher or a lot higher, you know, than what it is today. So it's a case somewhat of do or die um, because I think the industry has reached a point where there's a glut, it's become same old, same old, and people are lifting their heads high to up to see what can we do next? How can we bridge the very wide gap between the quality of production um, between Hollywood and, and Nollywood? And one of the biggest ways, you know, to jumpstart and fast track that is in partnering with um, um, foreign production houses, you know, and we've begin, we started seeing a whole lot of that um, lately in Nollywood. Okay. So I understand our time is up. Um, so I'm just going to let everyone uh, say something very quick in summary. Uh, let me start with you, Suri. When you look at um, the local production trend, what do, you, what, what do you believe are some of the in innovations you can anticipate uh, in the upcoming years? So um, from an innovation perspective, uh, I think um, a lot of production is going to go um, with a combination of um, AI and um, having integrated um, advertising built into um, the viewing of this content where consumers will start to be able to interact with the content, start to, if it's a show, they'll be able to um, online, uh, log into the show, participate, um, watching a movie, um, a watch up being on your screen. And if it's a movie screened in Mauritius, you click on the watch up and there's a deal for you um, on a holiday. Or if it is um, a movie with fast cars, there's another watch up on your screen and you click on it and there's a deal for uh, a BMW or Ferrari or um, and you being able to interact and engage with the content that you're watching. Um, so I think that's the future of where content is going to go. I think user-generated content is going to explode um, because if I see how consumers are watching content today and the demand for this con for content, and that's why platforms like TikTok that um, launch post um, Facebook and Google and stuff that um, were messaging and searching platforms has just taken, uh, and the market has just adopted to it, is the fact that they can be themselves, they can share their content, and um, consumers are starting to move to pieces of content that they like and what they want. They're becoming very demanding in terms of what they want to watch, how they want to watch, when they want to watch, and from a content perspective, we content producers need to start understanding consumer behaviors and start building content for consumers now and how consumers want to view this content and the types of genres. I think Ayana um, touched on this. Um, the genres of content is gonna become very important. And I think there's lots of data that a lot of these platforms have like Netflix and, and Amazon as well, where you can see the trends of the content that they are licensing and producing using a lot of the insight that comes out of their platform. As customers, you can see what's most watched, what's trending, what's popular. Um, and I think a lot of intelligence um, is needed going forward um, to start to innovate and build content um, that will, will start to do well in these markets. And I think also um, the mindset of uh, right. producers um, is starting to look at different opportunities because um, and, and 
this is not a negative to, <laughs> to Amazon or Netflix, but they're going to own this content. Um, and when this content is produced, it's specific for that platform. And how do we start embracing other platforms in the market and start extending this content to these platforms to enable um, access um, to more consumers in the market that can afford to through different platforms? Thank you, Suri. So uh, unfortunately, our time is up. I want to thank all the panelists for making the time and obviously for everyone who's participating. I hope we have the privilege of your time. Over to you, Beatrice. Thank you, Tamima. And thank you to everyone who takes the time to connect at today's virtual conference. And we are back tomorrow at 9.25 a.m. for day two. And thank you so much and good evening to you. Bye.